Good. Wait, wait. All right. Go loud. Our world is hyper. Keep going. It's not going. Our world is hyper with the. Come on, Bob. Loosen it up. You can do it. <laughs> we'll never be able to speak at this key. <laughs> the bloopers are already done. <laughs> you got the life, you're a winner for the world to behold. And good, yeah. and, everyone good. Will know. and everyone will know. And everyone will know. <laughs> We're in the future, in the place where everyone wants to go. Nailing it, dude. Nailing it. Keep going. You already know. Are and, you seeing something? I'm not seeing And we're going to be not. Oh, we're not sinking. Stop that. <laughs> We're on a journey to the Enterprise Cloud. We're in this together and we're still proud. So we'll take, it, we'll take it line by line. Yeah. We're right behind you, which is me right now. Right behind you, right now. No one around is gonna hold us down. Don't go too low. You kind of get out of the picture there if you go too low there. Should we do, did anyone do this? We used to sell you boxes. We used to sell you boxes, now it's all about us. Three, four, we used to sell you boxes. One, two. <laughs> Our infrastructure's gonna have you taking over the show. Now you're just dancing to the end and give it to the, we can make your hands clap. All right, four of these. You're just dancing through. Bringing it home. Into the lens, we can make your hands clap. Here it comes. We can make, make your hands, hands clap. clap. You will make our hands clap. We'll you will make, make our hands, hands clap. And, and you will make our hands clap. Really good. Okay, good let's cut it there. <laughs> <laughs> Man. I get to see the rough track. Really great job. It's just hard work. All right, let's cut it. <laughs> <laughs> Always a pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Vice President, Product Management, Nutanix, Raja Mukhopadhyay. Welcome. Welcome to day two of Dot Next Europe in beautiful, beautiful Nice. Are you all having a great time in the conference so far? How about a quick round of applause for all of our speakers from yesterday's sessions? Now, in his keynote yesterday, Sunil talked about the core cloud within your private data centers the distributed cloud in your remote office locations, and finally, the edge cloud, the cloud that exists in your retail stores, in your airport terminals, your oil rigs, and such. And in today's session, we are going to share with you our vision on how the enterprise cloud will evolve so that we can handle your use cases in the edge. Now, some of you may be thinking, look, on a daily basis, I manage infrastructure in the data center. What has the edge got to do with me? And that is a fair question. And I think it's best probably to look at a historical parallel. A lot of you, you manage a VDI environment in your data center. And if you look at VDI, it used to be a data center application. And then 10 years back, the iPhone came on scene. And then the iPad and other tablets, they came on scene. And all of us, as end users, we demanded that we get to use the enterprise applications on all of those mobile devices. So that meant that you had to take your VDI solution in the data center and then augment it with mobile device management solutions. The point is that VDI went from being a data center application to being a stretched application, stretching from the data center all the way to the edge. And that is something that we see is going to happen more and more. If you look at all of your data center applications, they are going to become stretched, one foot in the data center, the other foot in the edge. And that is why we think the edge is going to be relevant for all of you. Now, what about the architecture for the edge? We are working with a company, and they are in the business of developing software for self-driving cars. In a particular city, they have a fleet of 60 cars, all kitted out with cameras, with radar sensors. Each car generates about 16 terabytes of data per day. So if you work out in aggregate, 
That's about a petabyte of data that's hitting sort of the edge location in a given day. Now, you cannot afford to send all of the data across the van to the cloud for processing. So what do you do? They're processing the data in the edge. They're whittling the data volume down to the amount of about 10 gigabytes per day. And that is when, uh, you know, the architecture for the edge is going to evolve into essentially the edge doing real-time processing, cutting the data volume down, responding to events in a low latency manner, and then longer-term processing being reserved for the public cloud. Now, the data center and the edge, in our view, they differ in three crucial dimensions. The first one is the scale that the edge has to handle. The second one is that the edge will require us to miniaturize our technology in unprecedented ways. And then finally, the edge, in our view, will require a platform that exposes extremely sophisticated technologies in a simple one-click manner. Let's look at scale. The top three public cloud providers, they have about three and a half million servers in their data centers. All of you, across all of your data centers, the aggregate scale is about 32 million servers. You go to your remote office locations, that's about three million servers. You get to the edge, all of the IoT-enabled devices, your temperature sensors, your HVAC sensors, your surveillance cameras, three billion. That's billion with a B. And that's my point, that any edge platform will have to handle a scale that is so much higher than whatever we have seen in data centers. Now, the second aspect in which the edge is different is essentially the fact that edge applications will need a data pipeline, a data pipeline that stretches all the way from the sensors to the core cloud. And while data is flowing through that pipeline, we would need the ability to inject arbitrary snippets of code to transform the data, to summarize the data. And the thing is, if you look at the data center, the virtual machine has been the unit of computing. But a virtual machine is too heavy a construct for the edge. So we are seeing a lot of you, our customers, you are deploying your edge applications using lighter weight, containerized microservices. But even containers need to shrink further for the edge. We believe that the right unit of edge computing is a lightweight function. Functions that are ephemeral, functions that kind of spin up right when an event comes around, does a little bit of processing, and then spins down. And all of this clearly will require a new pass layer for the edge, something that allows the developers to stitch all of these distributed functions very quickly and easily. Now, the last aspect in which we think the edge is unique is the fact that the edge is where human beings and machines interact. And if you look at how we have interacted with machines, not much has changed in the last 50 years. We either go and push some buttons or we punch certain words into a keyboard and then the machines respond. We are in the midst of a seismic shift in the human machine interface. Already today, and then even more so going forward, machines will see, they will hear, and they will respond to touch. If you look at self-driving cars, already software has subsumed that very human of functions, seeing. If you go into hospitals, you see doctors and nurses, they are increasingly talking into devices. You look at retailers, they are experimenting with technologies such as augmented reality, where you can go into a retail store and you can try out a whole bunch of outfits in a virtual fashion. My point is that edge applications will require the manipulation of these extremely sophisticated technologies, image recognition, natural language processing. So that means we need a platform that can democratize these functions, that can sort of expose them in a simple one-click manner. And to 
show us more about how we are going to bring some of these capabilities in the enterprise cloud. Let me bring on stage Satyam Vagani, VP Technology at Nutanix. Bonjour, Raja. So what cool technology are you going to show us today? Well, I'm very excited to share with our audience here how we are translating the vision you laid out, laid out Raja, into some early technology. Let me show you a prototype version of Prism, which manages for the first time edges and sensors and the cloud as first class entities. We are going to do this in the context of a use case, a smart airport. Yep. Imagine a smart airport which has different types of sensors, let's say 2,000 surveillance cameras, a few hundred HVAC sensors, and a few hundred kiosks uh, where you print out your boarding passes. All of them are connected to edge computing infrastructure at the airport. And imagine 10 of these airports all connected to the cloud. Yeah. Now as I log in, you will see that each of those 10 airports, going from Atlanta to Charles de Gaulle to my favorite San Francisco, they all show up as edge locations. Each edge is a cluster of Nutanix nodes. The San Francisco airport, for example, is three node Nutanix mm -hmm. cluster. If I click through, you will see that the San Francisco airport is connected to the 2000 odd cameras and the few hundred odd HVAC devices and kiosks. So what you're saying is that going forward, Prism will treat edge locations and sensors and data sources as explicit first class objects in our object model. That's right, we are moving from a web scale model for managing enterprise cloud um, or the private cloud to a planet scale model to manage edge computing. And the way in which we're gonna handle that scale Today, a lot of you have Prism Central deployed in your data centers as a singleton VM. And that way, you get to manage thousands of nodes. We're gonna take in our 5.5 release train, we're gonna scale Prism Central out. And that way, you can manage tens of thousands of nodes. But we are not gonna stop there. We're gonna take Prism and make it a cloud service. And that way, we can manage hundreds of thousands of nodes and beyond. So that's where we are taking our Prism technology. Right. So, how about, we talked about, you know, how do we help developers kind of stitch together these edge applications quickly? What can we do there? Right, we have some opinions there as well. We saw the operations part of the puzzle. Now I'm going to take you through an example application development lifecycle. Uh, here we are going to create an application which is going to look out for an object of interest, again at our smart airport, in this case a red car. The idea is for all the image sensors to stream in live uh, data into the edge so that the edge can run machine learning, figure out whether a red car exists in a picture or not. And once we convert that into metadata, we are going to send that metadata to the cloud so that people can construct dashboards around red car occurrences. So that all sounds pretty complicated, right? So how do we make that simple? Yeah, in fact, if you were to do it right now from scratch, one would need to figure out how to deploy machine learning at the edge, how to source data from thousands of sensors into the edge infrastructure, how to process it, how to move the metadata to the cloud. All of these are infrastructure concepts. I see, and I so see. So a typical IoT application will have to deal mostly with infrastructure problems and less with business logic. I see where you're going. So essentially what you're saying is much like in the data center, we cut down the provisioning time, the deployment time, we brought it down from weeks to minutes. We are gonna do the same thing in the case of the development of edge applications. We're gonna bring it down from months to minutes. Quite literally. In fact, let me show you guys. So I'm going to start by creating a new application, uh, this time around our red car application. I'm going to choose all the data sources, all the image so sensors from the San Francisco airport. And since we are looking for cars, I'm going to restrict myself to cameras in the parking lot. I'm going to ask the system to automatically sample all the 800 cameras once every 15 seconds, run it through a object recognition function, look out for cars that are red, and in this case we are mostly interested in looking for presence or absence of the car. And I'm going to ask the system to automatically transfer the metadata after the recognition process to the cloud. In this case, we are hardwired to the Google Cloud. I'm going to choose the SQL service at Google. I press create, and there you have it, a brand new IoT application. So that is all it took? Yes. That sounds too good to be true. <laughs> I mean, can you, can you talk a little bit more of what's going on under the hood? Let me prove it to you. Okay. We 
created a debug UI just to give you guys a glimpse into what the Edge is doing on behalf of this application we created. So if we go to this screen, we see here that pictures from different cameras in the yep. parking lot are streaming in live, and the image recognition model is figuring out if the picture has a red car or not and converting into metadata, which eventually makes it to the cloud. So this is a live picture stream, and the software is figuring out on the fly whether it's detecting a red car or not. That's right. And wow. while we are on the subject, Raja, you are parked on level three area F, just so you know. How do you know that? Huh? You know, okay. too many details. Okay. Moving on, uh, let me show you that the data has also made it to the cloud while we were chatting about it. And so out here, is the Google Cloud Platform SQL Console. I am happily logged in, and here's a statement to choose the last 10 events from a SQL table called redcar underscore cloud that we asked for, and there they are. So this is where in the cloud you can see which airports are detecting a red car and which ones are not, right? Exactly. Wow. Uh, sixth one is yours, by the way. But again, details. So what about all of this code? Is this deployed as a VM, or how is it all happening? Uh, it is functions. It's lighter weight than VMs and containers. And the idea was to appeal to what matters to developers, which, okay. is, which is for them to be able to write raw code and be able to deploy to the system. So let me show you a different part of the system where developers would upload code into the system. Uh, here's the object recognition function that we used earlier. Some of these could be provided by Nutanix. Some of them could be written by um, the end user. I'm going to visit a very simple function. This is a function to detect temperature anomalies at the San Francisco airport. It's looking for every part of the airport which is greater than 80 degrees Fahrenheit and generating an alert. And this is the total length of the function. As you can see, it's focusing more on the business logic, this line right here, detecting temperature as opposed to focusing on infrastructure logic, where how to source the yep. data, where to output the data, how to run this function, and so on. Makes sense, makes sense. So you can see, in terms of miniaturization, where we're gonna take our technology, our physical form factor, in the data center, you get to run three node clusters for your distributed and edge clouds. In the 5.5 release, we'll bring it down to two nodes, and for your smallest edge locations, all the way down to a one node cluster. But more importantly, we're gonna evolve our platform so that it goes from a platform that manages virtual machines to a platform that today also manages containers to one that manages distributed functions at scale. And so that's how we're gonna evolve the platform. Right. So what about, you know, in the edge applications, they're very vertical specific. Hmm. So we created one application, and if a developer in a different vertical needs a slightly different application, how do they go about doing that? Right, so if you think about it, Raja, we created an end-to-end -end IoT application all the way from the sensors to the edge to the cloud by assembling three Lego bricks. The first brick collected data from hundreds of sensors. Uh, the second brick took all that data as images and ran machine learning on it. And the third brick figured out how to move that metadata to the cloud. And so let me show you how by reassembling, uh, changing the input to these Lego bricks, we can create brand new applications. Okay, and what and is the brand new application? Is it like right. we so again, something else? Yeah, we are going to stay in context, the okay. smart airport. This time around, we are going to look for uh, people waiting in lines. And the use case is detecting congestion at different parts of the airport, let's say at check-in counters or at the security area or the boarding gate, okay. for the airport manager to take action, maybe deploy some more resources okay. at those points. So we go back again to our application creation view, start by creating a new application. This time around, I'm looking for all data sources that are image sensors at the San Francisco airport. Since I'm looking for people, I'm going to restrict myself to all the cameras at the terminal, ask the system to sample those 1,200 cameras once every 30 seconds, run it through object recognition again, but this time around, look for people. And this time around, we are interested in counting them. Since we are developing the application mostly for the airport manager, I'm going to keep the metadata at the edge so that they can potentially construct a dashboard out of it. And so I choose the destination as the edge, press create, and yet another IoT application. And that's all it took? Yes. All live, we just went from one ad edge application to another one? Changed a few parameters. Okay, and can we see the debug view on this one? Oh, for sure. And so there you have it. We are streaming in 
uh, different parts of the airport and counting people as they wait in different types of queues. And the count is what is eventually sustained on the edge. Wow, so this is a you know, picture feed from the San Francisco airport and we are essentially measuring the length of queues, huh? Exactly. Awesome, phenomenal. So you can see where we're gonna take our one-click technologies. We started off in the data center where our one-click technology managed nodes. With Calm, we are going up and our one-click technology would manage applications. And we're gonna evolve that where Prism is eventually managed in a one-click manner all of these distributed functions. So hopefully that gave you a quick preview into how over the next several years we're gonna evolve our platform so that we can handle all of these unique edge use cases. And as you go back to your work, and as you are figuring out what the edge means for your business, uh, please engage us. We would love to be part of that conversation and help you in that exploration. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome President Nutanix, Sadish Nair. I will start with uh, two announcements. One of them is a public service announcement, okay? The first one is, and this is not the public service announcement. The first one is an extremely important announcement. That is, do not miss uh, this evening's uh, session. You're going to see probably one of the most impactful uh, keynote presentation that you've ever seen. And I'm not uh, saying that in jest. Uh, you'll see Mick Ebeling uh, talk about not impossible labs. Some of you might even walk away from that presentation saying that I may have to change the way I see my life and the priorities within that. Uh, I really hope all of you will actually show up for that. So that's the number one. The number two is a public service announcement. Uh, this is a month in Europe that's very difficult to schedule. Because in November, there's all sorts of uh, conferences going on here. Amazon has a conference, VMware has a conference, Gartner has a conference, so Julie has a tough time figuring out where and how and when to schedule Nutanix conferences. But Julie, let me tell you, don't worry about any of those things. All you have to make sure is that it doesn't conflict with Peter Major's birthday. <laughs> if you've been to Peter Major's birthday party last night, you know what I'm talking about. Peter Major, I'm sure he's not in the room, is he? No, I know he's sleeping probably. He rented out a bar, closed everything, paid the money to keep it open until four o'clock. Cigarettes, cognac, vodka, and ACDC music, that's it, nothing else. I was there until around 12 o'clock and then I bailed, but others were there. Anyway, let's get started today. I have a few guests that's gonna come in and out, so I'm like, uh, uh, I'm gonna host them. And the first guest that we have is a phenomenal speaker doing something amazing, but instead of introducing, what I would love to do is to roll the video. Let's roll the video, and then we'll welcome him to the stage.
welcome the CEO of Hyperloop One, Mr. Rob Lloyd. Rob? Don't you wish that wherever you go, you have that, like you walk into your, from your bedroom in the morning, you have the video plays like that? Well, whenever I'm trying to drive from uh, the South Bay to, to uh, San Francisco, and yeah. it's two hour bone crushing, uh, soul crushing drive, yeah. I think we all want something different <laughs> than we have today. So some of you probably don't know the story. Elon Musk, the genius, and uh, Sherwin Peshevar, they both were flying to Cuba, right? And they asked for a piece of napkin from the uh, flight attendant. And Elon started drawing something about putting people into a vacuum tube and sending them at Mach 1 speed to wherever they want to go. Sherwin picked up that and said, why don't you write this as a white paper? And Elon apparently did that. And the garage that you saw, that's where it started. So the question I have is, from that, just a few years ago, to talking to countries about implementing this, so this whole changing the world, it's not that difficult, is it? No, it's easy. <laughs> um, actually, everything you just saw in that video, uh, the first test of a motor, uh, the, the subsequent full proof of technology, that occurred since May uh, 2016. So the speed with which we can develop today, the speed with which engineers can prototype, the tools we have are completely different than the tools that have been used to build transportation infrastructure that we're all used to. Um, thinking about this idea, honestly, the last major mode of transportation that was invented on the planet was the aircraft. Uh, I took the beautiful TGV from uh, Paris to Nice last night. Uh, that technology was invented 230 years ago, and it's had incremental improvements. The TGV is very nice. But why are we sending a great, huge train with 800 seats when most of those seats are empty on the journey that I went on yesterday? Why not packetize transportation? Why not send a packet only to the destination that it's going to go to? And the concept of Hyperloop is, in fact, the first new mode of transportation that I think we've seen in 100 years. So it's a big deal. It's a big deal. It's like the backbone uh, for the mode of transportation that uh, most of us realize today is not working to keep up with, with what we need. And by the way, if you think through this one, is it, it's also possible that something like this probably would not have been possible in the last decade, because this thing is basically a data center. It is a data processing system. It's an IoT. What is it? So. What it is is a, uh, a pod. I think of it as a capsule. Uh, it's a pressurized vehicle. Into that vehicle, we will have passengers, maybe 40 or 50, or we'll have cargo. Uh, we put it inside that steel tube. You see that door open. We remove the pressure down to less than 100 pascals of pressure, which is equivalent to around 200,000 feet of above the Earth's surface. By removing the pressure, you rem remove the resistance. We use an all-electric uh, motor, magnetic levitation, and effectively we float with an electric motor that pushes it along. There's no resistance. You go really fast. Yeah. And you can go, of course, above ground or into tunnels into city centers. So I look at it as the backbone for the world that we see evolving. Uh, when you look at the e-commerce on-demand expectations we have today of everything, we want what we buy, what we get, we want our applications now, right? It doesn't work when the way in which commerce is organized, we're taking big steel containers, sticking them on a ship, the ship goes to a port, they get loaded on a dock, we put them on the back of a train or on the back of a truck, it takes 27 days to get products from China to Europe, wow. right? We could do that in nine hours. That's not bad. How did you get to this? I mean, if you don't know, Rob used to run all of sales and all of R&D for Cisco systems for a long time. So he was actually one of us before he became a genius with Elon Musk and that group. I was one of you. Yeah, you were one of us. Not so cool, but now you are in a cool space. <laughs> How, like one day you just wake up. <laughs> See, cool. <laughs> One day you wake up and say, that's it, I'm going to try something. How do you get the courage to start a complete U-turn and do something very different where you're completely uncomfortable? So How look, do you start? Look, I spent 21 years at Cisco. Uh, when I started, 
nobody, honestly, there's some people who have worked for that company here, nobody knew what the internet would become. We had no idea. And as you watch that evolve and you had a chance to participate, that's actually, that's a lifelong experience. That's something great. It's changed the world, right? It has it. changed Absolutely. everything that we take for this granted. This still lost today. the backbone, basically. Yeah, we just, we benefited from the constant deployment of bandwidth, the changes in mobility, and we took on giants. So when we started, we were this company, we were the nimble guys, we had a whole way in which everything was done and we had to take on incumbents. We had to take on people that would resist us. So when I decided it was a great time to leave, it was just the right time. I thought, what else could I do? This guy that you saw who founded the company, Shervin Pishavar, called me up. I went to his office in, in uh, San Francisco. I went down to LA, I met 42 engineers geniuses that were working on the ideas. And I said, wait a minute, this could be the same experience one more time. And wouldn't it be cool to see an ability to do that twice? Instead of once, but twice, this will change the world. It's very binary. When this works and when it's put in, in, uh, in, in production, it will change everything that we expect today from our transportation systems. And so you it's were, a really cool opportunity. And you were telling me that you didn't feel like it was that big a different problem that you are solving or the way, the methodology, the people, the domain, it's all technology, well, computing. So, of course I thought something very different, transportation. I, 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 this, this is a hardware business, yep. right? You got welders working with PhDs and designers, it's uh, DevOps uh, for hardware. Um, but the patterns, for what we all do here were very similar. The patterns that I learned over 21 years at Cisco. This will take an ecosystem hmm. to make this work. It's true. Okay? This isn't gonna be us building this technology. This will be working with engineering firms, with construction firms. We wanna own the value part, uh, the IP, yeah. the software, yeah. and let other people manufacture. We don't wanna build aircraft manufacturing plants. We wanna Absolutely. be a light yep. IP company, so yep. the patterns for me were very common, and then the pattern of what we've all witnessed as bandwidth has deployed applications, and we just saw yep. some of that pendulum swinging as we cut applications to the cloud, then the performance at the edge. edge. This, th this is the backbone, yeah. right? And we have autonomous vehicles, we have drones, we have vertical takeoff and landing uh, technology now, but that's the last mile. And what we don't have is something really fast to accommodate the backbone. So yeah. this, I believe, is the backbone of the transportation networks of the future, and it's a network that it's we're a, building. It connects to everything. Streamlined way of looking. I really like the way you're thinking about that. Let me ask you this, though. I know that the initial plan is to launch with cargo, and, but ultimately this is about human transportation. Mm -hmm. How the hell can it be safe? You're talking about 1,000 kilometers, levitating, underground, above bridge, no air, how, I mean, I'm sure that you get this question all the time, but how do you answer this? Well, if, if something goes wrong, if there's a ca catastrophic problem and this uh, evacuated tube cracks, breaks, is attacked, uh, it fills with air. Uh, when something goes wrong at 39,000 feet, uh, the opposite is the case. Yeah. So inherently, it's a safer environment than anything we know today. If you travel on rail, uh, I was with someone in Finland this week, it hit a moose, right? The whole system stops uh, because of the interference that we have. When you saw the Google car on that and the LiDAR technology which has been perfected, think of all the variances, light, rain, snow, ice, that those cameras have to adapt to, which they're learning to do today. This is a closed environment. We are gonna be running these pods in 10 second intervals. Yeah. 10 second intervals, right? At 700 to 800 miles an hour. So the data that's gonna be collected from that, the control software, which is really the value that we bring, um, because maybe others can build a steel tube, yeah. but it'll be the software platform that we build, it will be the control software, it will be the certification with regulators, which makes this a reality, you know what? and that's actually what we're trying to do right now. This makes me more concerned now, because it sounds like they've removed all the human elements, natural elements, the only thing left is our code. And we know how we write code. So it is going to be coming down to a software bug, isn't it? 
uh, it's going to be a software platform. Yeah, all right. I don't know if that gives me more confidence or less confidence. Let me ask you a different aspect of this. And this has been, um, you know, I'm getting more and more sort of um, passionate about this, which is the environment that we are living in, the, the, the responsibility that we have to make sure that we leave this in somewhat of a better shape than Peter Major left that bar last night, you know? And I saw that this uh, a line, for example, that tube, it generates more energy than it consumes. So uh, how does that work, and what is the environmental impact of something like so this? So it's an all-electric system. Yeah. Uh, the magnetic levitation is passive. You just need movement. You don't use energy. So the energy consumption is very low, including uh, maintaining the vacuum, which is uh, done in very low leakage rates. But look, we can use any form of electricity. We can have solar panels on the tube. We use very small right-of-ways because you can lift this off on a pylon and you can still have people or, or livestock or animals migrating underneath of it. So we don't create a, a big swath that fragments land, which, yeah. is a, which is very important. If we come into a city, we'll come into a tunnel uh, underneath the, uh, the subway station or the metro. And the size of that tube uh, at less than five meters is very fast tunneling. So uh, the, inter the interference with, with what we see on, on the surface, which is the problem with most infrastructure, is everybody doesn't want it to come by their house. They don't want it to come, a new rail line to come by where they live. So we'll be much less uh, intrusive, energy neutral, in some places where, where in the Middle East where we are seeing tremendous interest, and we might see the world's first Hyperloop built in that region, uh, come on, we can take more energy off the, the, the tube and the right-of-way through solar than we actually use. So this could be a new mode of transportation, completely energy neutral, good for the planet, better for people, right? Solving a problem that we all know we have, which is our modes of transportation aren't keeping up with how commerce is changing, and how our lives are changing. Population growth, yeah, right, absolutely. How many of you want to buy the ticket? Is there anyone in the room? Not bad. Actually, he was telling me that without having to sell a product, there are, how much is the, like, can I have a $32 billion dollar pipeline. There so you the go. Coolest, uh, <laughs> the coolest part of this is the first order we get, so we're a pre-revenue startup right now, uh, but the first order will be about three billion. So that's kind of like zero to three, <laughs> kind of cool. Right? But it's also pretty affordable, right? You're planning to hit this in yeah. an extremely affordable way. People change from a mode of transportation, and we've seen this with high-speed rail in Europe, yeah. is a great example. Yeah. Um, if, if the ticket uh, to go from Brussels to... Uh, uh, Germany, Br Berlin. And, let's say Brussels to Amsterdam. Right. If the ticket is 100 euro, if you price it less than that, you'll get almost 100% migration to, to a new mode of transport. A ticket in Dubai, uh, that we're looking at would be three and a half dollars. This isn't for rich people. This is an inclusive uh, uh, transportation mode. And when it works, I think it's gonna change our lives. Uh, it will be something that will be good for all of us. And it will, I think, relieve the fact that most of us hate the commute we face every day when we have to go to a city. And uh, I hope that all happens. These are the moments I feel like we are so fortunate to be alive today. Today. Yeah. I mean, we are able to watch these sort of things happening right in front of us. And together yeah. with people like this and with companies like yours and with the way in which we can develop at speed today, yeah. we can make things happen that used to take a decade yeah. and we can make them happen in a year or two. So thank you very much for letting me. Fantastic. Thank you so thank much, you. Jeff. Thank you. Thank thanks you. a lot. Rob, thanks a lot. I am, I'm, not sure how we are actually going to go to the, from here, but I have some really good guests here. I'm going to invite James and Terry to come on stage, please. James, thanks for joining us. I'm supposed to sit, but I'm, I had drank so much coffee, I'm not sure if I can sit. See, they have prepared, I think my team has prepared some really good intro for them. But I'm not a kind of a guy who does homework. I was never done. You know, in school I didn't, I was the kid who never did the homework until the last minute. And then I'll wake up and figure out something. And when the teacher starts the lesson, I'll go down like this to see that she won't call me. But almost always she calls me, right? So let's start with uh, 
that, but let me ask you this. Were you like me, or James, you look sort of like uh, that other kid in the front row always has the hands up saying, I know the answer. Um, well, I was more like you, I'd say. I was dreaming of being a rock star the whole time. Ah, uh, right. Yeah. <laughs> so, why don't you tell me in 30 seconds your entire life story from that kid to where you are? Okay, dreaming of being a rock star, um, got a degree in music, decided the lure of IT was too strong to, to turn down. Um, I went into IT, specialized in networks, became a CCIE, left that to run networks and banking, uh, to head up infrastructure, to now head up global infrastructure. At Schroeder's now? At Schroeder's now, yeah. Fantastic. Now, here, by looking at theory, we know that he was a punk in his class. He was always causing trouble, right? Is that, am I right, or? Uh, you're sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was quite serious. Uh, being prepared to get into a bank, yeah. that which happened afterwards. Uh, starting in a trading room technology that yeah. were quite uh, innovative 25 years ago. Yeah. And now working as a deputy CTO for World Set Banking in Société Générale, which is a universal bank in the Eurozone. Fantastic. So let's start. Let's start with, um, uh, I know this, probably you're thinking, what the hell is this? This is my way of visualizing digital disruption. Okay, this is what I could find. Like I said, I don't do homework. <laughs> so, Nutanix is a young company. But we somewhat think like sometimes, oh, we are a, now it's a mature company, we are eight years old. But then I look at these two companies, between them, this is probably 350 years of history. Uh, 200 years at Schroeder's, 160 or so with the Societe Generale. I already see how hard it is to change direction and change culture and some of those, like sometimes new things come up in an eight-year-old company in Silicon Valley. How do you begin to think about adopting to the fast changes that are coming uh, in, in an organization with uh, a 200 years of history, James? Let's start with you. Well, for us, it's a, a complete mindset change. So, yeah. um, you know, we've got uh, a, a new CEO that started last year who was very technology focused. He sees the you know, Schroeder's has been historically very successful, but where we are going, we need to rely on technology. You know, the internal tagline is that we are a technology company that sells financial products. Yeah. So with that, um, you know, we need to accelerate the pace of change, and we need to be really on top of our costs and got to understand the value we get from IT. Yeah. So with that, we change the entire operating model. So from a from mindset, you know, we've got absolute buy-in from the top, and then we've had to de you know, deploy an act. Start at the top, basically, yeah. leadership, yeah. yeah. How about a large bank? Globally present, different cultures. How do you? Different culture. We can say that there was a very uh, specific IT world within our bank. A few years ago, we started to uh, encompass every, everybody within the bank to get the ideas about how we should manage transformation. Yeah. And we got a huge amount of answers from everybody within the bank. So we start to understand that it was a general phenomena. Then we provided uh, tablets to everybody. It was. Uh, at our 150th anniversary. And then we started to move away, uh, focusing a lot on cloud, private cloud, uh, on data, uh, and now moving around uh, uh, that data management, uh, inter uh, artificial intelligence. So a lot of things happening. And the key point is that everybody within the bank is now committed of, yeah. on this transformation, starting by the top management that is very much aware on participating to it. I completely get it. Starting at the top makes perfect sense. But how about as you get to the lower layers? I mean, in this room, I'm pretty sure that, I'm sure, like, when I see changes happening in front of me, there are times where I'm pretty scared about it. I mean, is this, is this going to threaten the way I do things? What happens when things change around me? What am I going to do about it? How do you take the masses and say, this is the direction to sort of march? How do you drive the people and say, look, this has to happen, and this is the direction to go. So when we look at infrastructure, you know, we were historically some uh, request maker, receiving yeah. some requests, making it happening. Now we are moving to a solution provider. It's a completely change of, uh, of paradigm. Pushing, inside the company, inside yes, the bank. Yeah. Yes, yeah. pushing ITs to use services from infrastructures, of course, leveraging from our private cloud or public cloud infrastructure, uh, providing our services through APIs, uh, on really working more closely with, uh, with IT. So this is a completely uh, change of, of mindset. And, and we have also to make sure that our people from infrastructures are moving towards a more uh, development skills. Yeah. And what is interesting is that we see a lot of people 
coming from application development on joining infrastructure on being, being really passionate about infrastructure. How about that? Uh, infrastructure being cool again. On yes. <laughs> I yeah. see that. How about your view? Well, for us, it was a complete mindset change and a cultural change. You know? And what was really important is language. Yeah. You know, when you go into Agile, you're now dealing with sprints and program interment plannings. And you know, every three months or every 12 weeks, um, you know, we'll stand up and send postcards from the future about where we want to be and what we're going to accomplish. And you make the whole methodology all about outcomes. Yeah. So um, this entire journey, you know, we're not done with it. We're starting with technology, but it'll go throughout the entire company. Um, and you know, once you're all singing from the same hymn sheet, so to speak, you're using the same language. It's a lot easier. And uh, we saw the Satyam and Raja's presentation on IoT. It was interesting to hear that a 200-year-old company already embracing it with passion and finding business cases that make sense to the customers. How, how does that journey happen inside Schroders? Well, for, we're using IoT to make our employees as efficient as possible. So, you know, so, so outside of all the hosting and all the technology and making everything run, we've also got a massive mandate to make our people as productive as humanly possible. Got it. So we're consolidating four buildings in the middle of the city of London. We're building our own brand new HQ, and yeah. this is a smart building. Yeah. So everything's got a sensor on it. We've got BLE sensors everywhere as well. We're deploying a Schroder's app. So you know, if you're looking for a meeting room, you can have your internal set up tell you where to go. Yeah. But once you're in that room, you, know, you can control the AV, the heating, the lights, the blinds, you know, the airflow, everything you like there. Uh, and when you vacate it, you know, digital signage updates to say the room's available now and everyone else is updated. So you know, we are all there just to make our employees as productive as possible. Good for the environment. Good for the people? Yeah, well, we hope so. Yeah, I mean, there's sensors all over the building that when the sun's in a certain place, you know, we can yeah. in the, the temperatures, et cetera. We recycle rainwater, yeah. you know, toilets, et cetera. So, yeah, we, you know, we're really embracing this. Fantastic. I actually had an opportunity to visit your uh, new office in La Defense recently. Is it La Defense, right? Oh, it is a legend. Uh, it's part of Paris. Part, part of Paris, <laughs> yeah. And um, it almost felt like a Silicon Valley yuppie town, you know? It's got uh, sleeping pots and massage tables, and people can just take their you know, laptop or iPad and go wherever and work. I was pretty surprised that uh, it was know, Society General has actually moved to that. It was quite a big process. shift, moving from the big towers we had in La Défense yeah. to something much more horizontal, as we could say, in the east part of Paris. Uh, when we had this project three years ago, we, we found it was the right timing to rethink how we should organize our offices moving to, to full flex offices, allowing people to work, to work from home, which yeah. was quite uh, new in the bank, and also um, favoring a kind of startup culture. So we even put a, a place called Le Plateau, yeah. for which we can welcome some startups that are not within the bank, and we can also uh, mature and grow some internal startups. So you, see the, you fund and farm other companies to come in and work there. Yes, yes, and, and they are mixing also with the people from the bank yeah. working on innovation. This is an extremely sort of exciting thing that I found out. You know, you walk into a 160-year-old, third largest bank in France, and you go to the headquarters, you see other startups being incubated inside their bank. Fantastic, fantastic idea. You know, being uncomfortable, I love that approach. I want to talk about the cloud part. Nutanix got engaged with uh, both of your companies a few years ago when you decided internally that you need to become more of a service provider as opposed to an IT organization. And uh, we were lucky enough to partner with you and become sort of the preferred uh, cloud service provider. What is sort of, um, I'll ask two different questions. First, uh, you, James. Where does the, the, the security slash privacy, the balancing act that happens between uh, the, the cloud service provider. I know everyone wants like as much flexibility with security mm. and with privacy. I guess in reality, is this possible? How do you communicate the pros and cons of? I think we would come down to, to data types and data classification. Yeah. You know, if it's, it's highly sensitive client data, for example, then you know, we take zero risk with that and zero gambles. But we also do a lot with big data and big data analytics, and we get a lot of that data from public sources. Yeah. So um, it, you know, for us, it's all down to, to workloads. But if it's publicly manageable data that we're putting IP around and we're, we're making decisions from this data, you know, we're more comfortable putting that in the public cloud. But anything private, anything customer related, you know, we, we you are talking about financial data, regulations, yes, and all those things as well, right? Yeah. Are you sort of um, pushing the edge, do you think, when it comes to engineering processes and everything as an organization? Are you, how comfortable are you where you are at your? Uh... Um, well, I don't think we ever allow ourselves to be comfortable. We, uh, you know, we, we, 
I think if you're really comfortable, then complacency can kick in. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, we're continually reassessing our operating models, continually assessing the skill set needed in the teams, yeah. how we bring development and infrastructure much closer together. Yeah. It's always a continual challenge. But you know, ultimately, if, while we're adopting the other methodologies, if we're all on the same beat, you know, the same two-week cadences of how we improve our products and how we get things out there. You know, Hiring and retaining talent, yeah? Yeah. Now, to you, I have a different question, which is slightly general, is uh, in a cloud in itself, because some of your uh, operations are in Asia. Asia, you're pretty big now, Singapore, Hong Kong, all of these places. So when you say whether you go to cloud or not, is that somewhat of an irrelevant question, because if your data centers are all tethered together, that in itself should look like an Amazon or a Google data center, because the, you move users around. When I talk to your uh, team in Hong Kong, they have the same questions and same concerns that you have. Uh, where is the architecture brain? How do you split all this? How do you make them empowered to make their decision but stay within the policy? So, well, first, we, we have been used to work as a global team for a long time. Yeah. We are very uh, committed on what we call the follow the sun model making that our business is a worldwide business, but it is operated when our people are waking up, or are awake, sorry. Uh, so, so for that, uh, we, we use a common pattern, a uh, common solution for, uh, for, for, the, for, for the hardware uh, with Nutanix, for instance. Um, but but it, it, it is a centrally managed platform uh, relying on some distributed solutions. This is really uh, the way we do it. And we started in Paris and after uh, disseminated our solutions in the States, in, in Asia, or in other locations in, uh, in Europe. So it was a starting point in Paris. And as it was very much standardized, uh, the bank field, it was a good solution. And we had good commitment on buying from the other locations. So you prototype and then spread it out. Yeah. Any last words for the team here? Anything else that you want to share with the group? Well, uh, maybe um, I think uh, when we discuss about that, it was important to share also what, what is important for us going forward. I think that uh, as, a, as manager of infrastructures, I've got uh, three items that are very key for me. First one is security, it's something very, very important. Second one is that we have to manage, uh, in one hand, uh, the brand new world, but also the existing world. And this is quite a challenge to manage the, 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 the two of it. And the third point is that uh, I, I would love, love sorry, to be much more aware about what's going to happen in the future, so to have much more predictive knowledge about my infrastructure. Very good. Anything from you, James? Me? I, I would say challenge everything. There can be no sacred cows. Yeah. You know, you, you've got to, if you've got the mindset of, well, we've always done it this way, you know, you've got to change that. Ask of why not? Eh? Absolutely. Why not? Look, this is the reason why I love my job. I get to have an opportunity to talk to people like Thierry and James all over the world, learn from them, help build this company to be adaptable, flexible, and to face the challenge of the new world. And hopefully, you'll also have an opportunity to talk to them. They'll be here as well for the rest of the day. Thank you so much, gentlemen. I appreciate it. Thank you. James, yeah. fantastic, man. Thanks a lot. So the whole sort of uh, theme of this morning was a little bit forward-leaning. You knew that. You knew that Nutanix is not shipping IoT uh, stuff today. Uh, Hyperloop is not out yet. However, these are all relevant technologies that are changing. So in that, keeping that theme alive, I want to close off this morning session with a, a short conversation about artificial intelligence and deep learning, and how some of those things are changing our lives and connect to Nutanix and see how Nutanix has plans to not just be relevant, but disrupt the way we look at infrastructure, okay? Let me start with this uh, story of, uh, in US, this is a billboard in US, as you probably all know, if you go to US and switch on TV, what do you see? Advertisements for hospitals, catheters, pharmaceuticals, right? And then pharmaceutical medicines for cancer, and right next to that, you will see another uh, ad from a, a lawyer who will say that if you bought that medicine that you just saw and have another type of cancer, call me, right? It's just nonstop. Here is one which says, doctors who deliver. You get the pun, right? Doctor, delivering baby, and all of that. The only problem, this is an old billboard. The new one looks something like this. The new one, all it says is, come to me and you can see a doctor in four minutes. Here's the difference. 
The previous one was about healthcare. It was about the doctors, the patients, the nurses, the MRI machine. This one is all about IT. If you, there is an administrator's meeting going on in the boardroom, and if they decided that, look, we have to make sure that our patients get to see a doctor in four minutes, guess who the team is looking to? The CIO. The CIO has to walk out and say, how do I make sure that the patients who are coming just to collect the MRI can do that at home? How do I make sure that their vitals are already collected as they're walking in? How do I make sure that inf inf insurance information is already there? It, these are all technology problems, right? If IT is responsible for this, can IT also do deduplication and compression and thin provisioning and replication and HCI and all flash? Probably not. As you heard from financial industry, their business is about outcomes. All of you in IT business are responsible for moving away from the data center and reaching out and touching your consumers at their homes, wherever they are, and helping them interact with your business and deliver more value. In that context, it makes perfect sense to think about the fact that computing is everywhere. Like Raja said, I cannot, in the middle of an ocean, if I'm in a rig, and if the rig is creating, let's say, 600 terabytes of data a week, I may have an anemic satellite link that is tethering me to the headquarters. There is no way I can move all that data to the cloud. I will have to move the cloud to where the data is being created. Makes sense. And as you all saw, that's what we've been talking about. If we can pull this off the right way, yes, we will solve some problems. But are we not creating new problems? Let's be honest about that. Are we not creating new problems by create, uh, eliminating and spreading at the computing to be everywhere? If computing happens on a ship, in a rig, in an airplane, in an airport, in a Humvee, in a drone, how do we make sure that we are able to manage all of them the right way? How do we make sure that we are not creating new management nightmares around it? If the systems are sitting inside a single data center, maybe I can put three people to manage it. But if my computing is happening in the middle of an ocean and there is no proper link to it, how do I manage it? Now, as vendors and customers, you know that we talk about this all the time. 75% of your cost is OPEX. And what we usually do, vendors, we come to you and say, look, you got to pay more because you will save on OPEX. And what do you usually say? You say, like, ah, don't talk to me about soft dollars. Give me a discount now. And don't tell me that it is going to take less people to manage because that's not how I do business. We play this game all the time. While we are playing around in this pie chart, I think we are missing something completely different, something even more costly. But usually what we do is we chalk up most of these issues around this as pilot errors, people errors. Like for example, in uh, uh, US when Equifax, one of the credit rating agency, screwed up and 140 million users' financial data was leaked out, a lot of people said, oh look, what a bunch of jokers. Their security was a mess, their password was admin123. Apparently it was admin123. You know, talk about cloud. You feel so helpless. I didn't do anything wrong. My data is out there. When you talk about public cloud, this is part of the problem. You outsource all the authority, but the responsibility, the fact that my financial information is leaked out, and there is nothing I could have done about it. When you talk about public cloud, you got to think about how that works. But as coming back to the, the pilot error, the fact that the password is admin123, do you think it's because the admins were stupid? Do you think it's because the admins said, you know what, I'm going to screw my company? No. Chances are the infrastructure is so complex that four or five different vendors have to come together, compute, storage, network, hypervisor to solve any problem. And these are different specialities and groups. They have to probably share the passwords. 
the complexity of the infrastructure is what caused that password probably to become that simple, because it is hard to share a large password unless you're a password manager and things like that. Some of them don't do it. Sometimes when you know, systems get hacked, they will say, oh, you know what, their firmware was not upgraded. Again, why was it not upgraded? Is it because people didn't want to? Or is it because it takes more effort than what it takes to pass a law in British Parliament to upgrade a system? You have to go let everyone know, bring the systems down. Is it possible that the complexity of the systems that we are selling you is what is making all these things to go become big mess? Is it possible that complexity is the single largest, most expensive item that is hiding? What are we doing about it? Vendors, for us, complexity is bottom line sometimes, because I can sell you more and more software to solve. And in some organizations, complexity becomes job security. People start blaming, and almost always it becomes a pilot error. It's someone's fault. And then we move on. Vendors, we don't address this problem at all. It can't happen in a different world. In a, it can't happen if the computing is happening everywhere. So let me talk about how potentially the new world can have answers. And to do that, I need to go back and show you a story from this. I know most of you probably know this game, chess. How many of you know the game on the right side? Wow. I'm impressed. I was in Asia. Most people didn't know this. So it's good to know. Maybe Asians didn't want to raise their hand. It's called Go. Uh, or in Chinese, it's called Beichi. In, uh, I think, Japan, they call it uh, Igo. Korea, they call it Baduk. No matter what you call it, it's an amazing game. I don't know it. I've been told. Freeman told me it's actually an amazing game. This game, chess, is an extremely complex game. The number of options you can have in a single game of chess is 10 to the power of 120. If you think that's actually a small number, let me tell you, if you take all the atoms in everything in the whole world, not just you and me, the entire thing, that atoms are there, and put it all together, that is 10 to the power of 8 zero. It's a complex game. But in 1997, human beings, we were beaten by machines. Deep Blue, Gary Kasparov, some of you may remember, right? How did we do that? Very simple. We did brute force computing. We threw enough computing to calculate six steps ahead of whatever move Gary was making and use a value network algorithm to figure out which one should they go with. That's it. And if you can throw enough computing, you could beat it. However, you can't do that with this other game, because that one is a little more complex. Oh yeah, this is what happens in a geeky cloud, because you know that 10 to the power of 761 is a much, much bigger number, right? It did not happen until this year. Until this year, in 2017, finally, we beat the best player using machines. How did we do it? We did it by changing the way how we approach the problem. Instead of telling the computer what to do, we started telling the machines how to think, how to learn, how to improve. Fascinating story. Give the fish versus teach fishing. Intelligence. Let's dive a little deeper into what intelligence means. You could all make an argument that this little animal on the left, a snail, is not so intelligent animal. All it does is essentially come and eat the vegetable garden every time I try to plant something. That's all it does in its life. You could make an argument that this horse is actually a really smart animal, isn't it? Because if you drive, ride that horse all the way to the cliff, it will look down and say, I'm not going to go down. It's not because it understands gravity and Newton's laws around gravity. It simply knows in its brain, I shouldn't fall down. It's not like it fell down many times and died and came back like a computer game. Somehow, the horse knows, I shouldn't go down. A two-year-old girl is probably smarter than this horse because she knows that she can break an egg and somehow 
it is fluid, but if I heat it, it becomes solid again. Again, not really because she knows fluid dynamics, but she knows. Something inside the brain is different for them. So let's go inside the brain. Neurons. If you look at the number of neurons, there's some correlation here. That stupid snail is stupid because it only has two. I hope I'm not offending anyone if you are any snail lovers in the room. Just go with it, okay? A horse, 60 billion, 250. Now, that's the problem because by this, we should all be working for elephants, isn't it? The world should be ruled and we should be like working for them. So this can't be it. There has to be more to it. Let's go deeper inside that. Now we are getting closer. Yes, the brain is big for an elephant, but the interesting things inside the brain happens in a place called cerebral cortex. Inside the cortex, we obviously have significantly more as a percentage and a total number of neurons. Now this is interesting. So what happens inside the cerebral cortex? Inside the cerebral cortex is where our sensory places are sitting. So we have visual cortex where we can see, auditory cortex where we can hear, somatosensory cortex where we touch and feel. So all these things happen. Is it about just collecting information? Not necessarily, because yes, we collect, and that is interesting, but so can other animals, right? We do something different after we collect. Learning, simply put, is our ability to acquire information for sure, but most importantly, make it better by thinking. Thinking is the process that connects all these neurons and make it better and better and better. It's like, you know, Isaac Newton. Sir Isaac Newton is sitting under the apple tree, apparently, and the apple falls on his head. If it falls on my head, I probably will be pissed off a bit and then eat the apple. But somehow, that sense forces him to do something amazing and then comes out with uh, uh, algorithms and uh, formulas that changes the course of human history. So, thought seems to be the thing that underpins everything about intelligence and learning. And if you look at how the neurons are laid, the neurons are laid as multiple layers and it's very deep, and somehow it all works together and comes out with something. This year, or I think late last year, University of Sussex did a study on this little brain of a snail, as much as it is. I guess it's not that difficult to do a study on a snail. Again, I'm going after snails, I shouldn't do it. It's a defenseless poor animal. Eats all my tomatoes, that's why I'm pissed off, you know? It's personal now. Apparently, those two neurons that it has, it does a very simple subroutine. All it does is two things. Number one, it sees if it is food. That's the first one. Second one, am I hungry? That's it. Is it food? Yes. Am I hungry? No. Move on. Is it food? No. Am I hungry? Yes. Well, I'm shit out of luck. I need to go move on. Find food. After all of those years of computing, if you write code, you know where we are. We are at a snail level. Because our subroutines are basically if-then loop, which is what this little guy runs. Whereas the brain operates at a completely different level. Brain does things amazingly different. What we changed in the last few years is that we have figured out how to do, how to emulate how human brain works. Now, the idea of artificial neural networks and uh, deep learning and um, machine learning and all of those things, this, those core ideas have been around since 1940s, by the way. It's not a new technology in that sense, new ideas. What is different now is that between the advancement in computing and between the advances, advancement that happened in terms of hardware technology like TPU, tensor processing units, the GPUs, the CPUs, and the access to cloud computing, we are able to do things faster. At the core of it, an artificial neural network tried to emulate the human brain by creating artificial neurons and lay them up deeply. So when people say deep learning, it doesn't mean that I'm sitting and thinking deep. It means is these neurons are laid out deep in multiple layers, and 
inputs are given on the top, but inside each one of these artificial neural uh, neurons, there are parameters that can be programmed through training and learning. But the, here the key thing is, the value of the programs are a priori unknown until it comes from the top. And it goes through multiple layers and the output comes up. In a sense, it can learn and improve based on the inputs that are changing, based on the parameters. Essentially, this allows us to do not just supervised learning, which is, if this is a horse, don't worry, that's also a horse. We have to teach them. We can move it to unsupervised learning where the system can figure out if this is horse, chances are that's a horse too. And if you put a zebra there, it can figure out that it is not a zebra. We built, we in the sense human beings, a, a UK company called uh, uh, AlphaGo. They built a computer uh, that does artificial neural network and beat the second best player in Go last year, a Korean guy, Lee Sodok. However, the system knew that it was not smart enough to beat the best player, Ko Jie. Because of the rating system, there is a computer program that can actually figure out the rating system. It didn't give up. It played 30 million times within itself. Gotten better, better, better. And this year, in May, it beat the best player in the world in Go. The best player. And you can see two things happen. Number one, the best players in Go are all Asians. Fact number one. Fact number two, when they are beaten, they sit like this. <laughs> it is fascinating. Because it's not that the system figured out how to play the game. Because like I said, you can't brute force it. What it did is something more interesting. It understood the game playing techniques of Lee Sodok. It looked, watched how Kajia plays the game. How does he react when you put him under pressure? What sort of mistakes he makes? How can I exploit it? What is the feeling that I can actually work with? We started making the machines have guts. Now, there are multiple ways. Remember we said we learn from different, different ways, sensors through seeing and uh, hearing and all of that? Because of that, the artificial neural networks can be divided into different groups. One of the way, one of the most popular way you do that is actually through seeing. And the artificial neural networks that can see input is called convolutional neural networks. This, because of Alberto and team, I had an opportunity to actually go and watch, see the, the painting on Sistine Chapel. Everyone knows Adam, master Michelangelo's painting. The brush strokes behind that. We know as human beings that's actually cloud. Not because it looks exactly like cloud, but you know that it is cloud. That's how our brain is wired. When you feed this to a convolutional neural network system called Deep Dream and let it interpret what it looks like, this is what it did. Yes, there are some kinks to be worked out. But the fact that the system is able to see and reproduce this, that tells you the possibilities. Now, that sounds sort of fun. What's the real use case? Like, like I said, you know, if you can see, you can hear, like in, there are recurrent neural networks, you can do different, different input, but what's the real use case? I'll give you one example. Satyam talked about a technique which allows us to understand who's uh, doing what. Now, obviously, a convolution neural network can make trial and error, figure out that that's actually an object, this is a human being, but it can be more than that. Is it possible that if I leave a suitcase on that bridge. Well, let's not be me, I'm a brown guy, I don't want to leave a bridge. Let's say a white person leaves a, a suitcase on that bridge. Is it possible for the system to look at the face expression and say, you know what, this person is happy. He may have just forgotten. But let's say this person is stressed out and it can understand that this person is stressed out, is elevated, is under stress, under duress, and left it. Maybe it needs to do something different. But how do you know you don't have a standard parameter on how a th person looks stressed versus somebody else who might be looking very different when they are stressed. That's a good use case for a system to learn. I'll give you another case where it's already tremendous amount of progress being made. Pathology. You take a, a breast pathology like this, 
the way it was done for many, many years is you put it under a microscope and human beings will look at that and see if this uh, cell is cancerous or not. That was a experience driven thing. Imagine you take this and divide that into billions of pixels and route everyone through a convolutional neural network and the system figures out which one is cancerous and which one is not. Which one do you think will have a better shot? You don't have to guess. Today, it went from almost 9% to 47% and actually climbing in terms because the systems are getting better at learning it. There are real life-saving use cases that are being done because of this. Now, that's all good. What's the question? Why are we here talking about this? Computing has changed. It used to be that we stood in front of a large data center and worship this monolithic machine. Whether it's a mainframe or a SAN array with a couple of servers on top of it, this is how it used to be, and IT organizations were built to manage it. But like I said, that's no longer the case. Today, the computing is distributed. It is not one mainframe or 10 SAN arrays. It could be thousands of servers deployed in hundreds of locations. Shouldn't the organization be different? Shouldn't it also change? How about users, end users? If you think about how end users access an app, there is an end user. That end user is access, wants to access an app and that app is running on infrastructure. It's a simple, straightforward system. However, we need IT in between. IT needs to manage the infrastructure. Every single request needs to go through IT. Nobody's happy that IT is sitting. I have to open up a ticket for that. No, IT is not happy. They have to come in the middle of the night to change how performance is managed. This has to change. Is it possible for us to elevate IT to be out of that loop and let the end user access the app directly through self-service capabilities, through learning, figure out how to curate the apps. Is it possible for the apps to automatically orchestrate by removing the IT from that loop and let the app manage the infrastructure? How? Through changing the way we interface with these machines. Instead of having a single interface, can we divide them into two groups? Can we deliver a machine-to-machine -machine interface and a machine-to-human interface? In the human-to-machine interface, let's talk natural language, intentful approach. Instead of saying, add more capacity to this project, can I say, this is my production network, make sure it never goes down and it never runs out of capacity. Make sure that it always has the highest priority, that's it. Let the system figure out. If I have 100 nodes, I'll do it one way, 200 nodes are different. Things like planning, placement, optimization, troubleshooting, all of those things, when you have hundreds of systems, it is better for systems to manage it. I should know as a system, when should I run a project? If I run it every Friday night, is it possible for when the user goes off, I manage it through systems interfaces without human being being involved. There is no question this is the way of the future, and there is no question that architecture like a distributor, dispersed cloud, is going to force us to think things like this. This is the context within which you have to think about Nutanix. Yes, we built a hyperconverged architecture, but it was not our end goal. We built a hyperconverged architecture where every piece of metadata has analytics built in. For the last seven years, we had it. We know who writes what, when, how, when they access it, how long do they access it for. We have a distributor stretchable metadata cluster. Now, we didn't talk about it, because it was not relevant, because we didn't apply that for you in a use case. We focused on features, maturity, security, all of those, because those were useful. But let me tell you, that's extremely important. Because on top of that, we added a virtualization layer that is fundamentally different. Why did we do Acropolis? Not because we want to piss off VMware. That's just a benefit, side benefit. It's just a bonus. The real reason we did this it's because we want to support VMs and containers and functions like they talked about, as natively as possible. We want to support security because the data is going to go out and in differently. We want to make sure that the cloud vMotion is light, simple, and secure. Most importantly, we also want to make sure we deliver all capabilities, including file storage and block, natively. But having said all of that, 
We want to make all of that invisible, all of that, because I don't want you to think about any of these things. It's like the file system on your iPad. Do you think about it? Heck no, right? Let's make it invisible. Let artificial intelligence-based architecture using APIs completely automate how the infrastructure is managed, completely. That's our southbound machine-to-machine -machine API. Let the application be delivered, curated, and protected through self-service portal for customers in a northbound and delivered through SDKs that others can add and remove through APIs again. That's our northbound approach. Make that automatic, make this automatic, let the users talk to the system directly, make the entire architecture invisible. This is an elegant approach for the new world. But not just for Nutanix, but also bring public cloud into that picture, bring Xi into that picture. Make all of that manageable and let the customers have the consumption model they want, whether it's own or rent. This is what we have been talking about. This is the essence of what we are trying to do. This is what we think makes Nutanix a company that to be forced to be reckoned with for the many years to come. If, obviously, we can execute on it. But you see why the hyper-converged architecture that we built is different? Do you see why the metadata structure, do you see why the locality of data is important? Do you see why true web scale architecture is important? Because without that, you cannot do any of these other things. So when you talk about hyperconverged, let's not compete on that which one has more IOPS versus which one has this feature, or which one is thrown into as an ELA because it is free. And a hyperconverged that is free is like a free puppy because you want to pay for it. Right? This architecture is built with the purpose of simplifying and making the infrastructure invisible. Most importantly, elevating the IT to focus on business outcomes. You can't do it unless you have the forethought to bring this architecture. Now, you might be thinking that all sounds good, but I just want to start somewhere. Let me leave you with this blueprint. If you're sitting in a data center and you're looking for a project where you just want to start and move away from a three-tier architecture, don't worry. Forget about everything I just said. We have the best, most secure, most featureful, most mature hyperconverge from Nutanix. You can use Hyper-V or VMware, whatever you want. Don't even change that. Once you become comfortable, you can absolutely move to the AHV and then suddenly unleash all the other features we talked about. It is there for you when you are ready. And VM migrate and DB extract and things like that, you can do that. When you are done with that, when you are ready for the next level, expose it through self-service and suddenly it looks, acts, feels, like a public cloud for your end users. Trust me, when you don't have to be involved, your end users are happier. Let me break it down to you. Your end users doesn't like talking to you. Not, nothing personal, they just don't like talking to you. Export it to the remote sites and then expand it to the edge when you are ready. This is a blueprint that you can implement today. This is a path to the future. This is how IT becomes a needle mover for your business. This is why you come to conferences like this because there are customers out there who have done all of this, you can talk to them, or customers who have done first one waiting to see can they go to the second one. This is why it is exciting. Not because you know IOPS and SSDs and all of those sort of stuff, those are all important. I'm not saying those are not important, but the real reason why to go all in on Nutanix is because it's an exciting world out there. We are talking about traveling from San Francisco, well, not San Francisco, let's say Abu Dhabi to Dubai. San Francisco, because of regulations, probably won't happen. <laughs> but Abu Dhabi to Dubai, you know, within 15 minutes, 20 minutes. It's an exciting time to be. There is no reason to be left behind when the world is moving this fast. Thank you, thank you so much. I know I ran a little late, but hopefully that was fun. I had fun talking to you all. Thanks a lot.